the limits of access. And you've got an abstract, I won't read it out, but with um, it's a great pleasure to now hand over to Tim. Thanks very much. Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to stand up because I find it much easier to talk when I'm standing up. Um, uh, it's a bit off putting having these little cameras follow my every move as I move around the room. Um, look, it's a really great present, pleasure to be here today, and I've been looking forward to it a lot. Um, there's a lot of historians at the University of Canberra, so um, I don't get much of a chance to really talk to, to people about the sorts of things that I do and the sorts of issues that I'm, I'm working on. So, um, yeah, thanks again for, 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 uh, for the invitation here. Um, and yes, you know, although um, I've spent probably the best part of the last 10 years working on, on building digital tools and, and resources and things like that, I still very much regard myself as a historian. Um, and it's important for me to, to you know, uh, talk about historians doing this sort of digital stuff. Um, but in the context of today's little talk, I thought I should explain the other part of my bio, which I, I generally, my three word bio is historian and hacker. Um, <laughs> So I thought I should explain the hacker bit of it a bit. Um, you know, hackers in the media are you know wear hoodies and uh, uh, inhabit basements and steal your your private data. Um, but really, when I'm talking about um, hackers, uh, I'm sort of drawing on an older tradition, older ideas around um, what effectively is uh, creative problem solving. I suppose is the, is the best way of talking about it. Um, someone who's prepared to sort of challenge the boundaries of, of technology and authority to try and make things better, to improve things, to find solutions. Um, and I often quote, um, oh, I should say, uh, too, that the, these slides that I'm uh, showing today are, are online, um, and they have some little do-it-yourself bits, so you might want to go and have a play around with them afterwards, and I'll, I'll make sure that URL circulated. Uh, but yes, um, Mark Olson has uh, written a book on, on a chapter sorry, on, uh, called Hacking the Humanities, and I often refer to it because it, it really, to me, speaks to, to what I, I, I think I do. Um, and he, um, he, has a, he talks about hacking as rolling your sleeves up and getting your hands dirty in contexts where you presumably do not belong. Um, and, um, you know, that, and that, that's, it's about sort of sticking your nose in, 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 in processes and, and uh, systems and technologies and, uh, and, and find, finding solutions, often in a sort of trial and error type of way. You know, they might not be the most elegant solutions. Um, they might not be permanent solutions, but they get something done. Um, they solve a problem. They make a difference. Um, and that's um, why I like that quote about a hack can be elegant or kludgy. Authored from scratch or patched together or remix, the important thing is getting things done, pushing the boundaries of what the humanities can do and the effects it can have in the world and where. So for me, this translates really to um, poking my nose into online collections. Um, and I'm not just talking about the content, of course. You know, We all access the content of, of, uh, of the wonderful collections which we're getting online. But also the systems that deliver that content. Um, and, you know, my research is around this idea of access and how we actually get that material and what it means when we get that material. And my argument, such as it is today, is really that by hacking around uh, at online collections, and we'll talk about possibilities for that, um, that we can start to understand the limits of access. And that, um, I'd suggest, is a really critical skill for historians nowadays and into the future. So, can I just see the address again, the URL for that slide? Certainly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's start off. Search engines lie. They do it all the time, and they do it very well. Um, so I uh, developed a little project last year with uh, some of my undergraduate students, where we developed a site for the crowdsourced transcription of records related to the White Australia policy from the National Archives of Australia. Um, that's still going on, you can jump on there um, and you can uh, actually, I'll see if that opens up, but you can um, uh, go in and you can help transcribe those documents. Uh, possibly other thing here. Um, and um, it, it, it's progressing quite well and we're getting useful, we, we, the, the documents have names, they have 
uh, locations, they have uh, where people left from, they have photographs in many cases. So they're there as images uh, in, on the archive site, but of course what we're doing is we're getting that data out of those images in a way that can then be analysed and used in different types of ways. So it was a great project um, to work um, with, uh, with undergraduate students and work with the Museum of Australian Democracy as well when we had an event over a weekend. That site uh, involves uh, records from just one series in the National Archives, ST84-1. Um, but of course there are many series in the National Archives which relate to the operations of the White Australia policy. How do you find them? If you go to record search and you do a search for White Australia policy, you find nothing. Uh, searching for series. Um, if you add, there's a little tick box under the, the keyword search. If you tick the box that says search notes, uh, then you get five series. Um, but not that one that we used in the project, that's C84 slash one. Now, you can do this yourself. I've included in these, this talk today little opportunities for you to go and actually do a bit of experimentation yourself to check what I'm doing. Um, and, you know, I'm doing this, I'm adding these little sort of try it yourself things because I want to suggest as I'm going through this presentation that you know, it's not a matter of turning everybody into coders. Uh, it's about starting the process of critical analysis of online resources. And a lot of that just starts with the search box. Um, so it's starting to think about um, search boxes not just as convenient services that we all use, but also as sites for critical analysis and experimentation. So, of course, as experienced researchers, you'll know why you can't find anything, any series in the National Archives by searching for White Australia policy. Um, there's a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, of course, what you're dealing with in terms of the archival collections and the metadata is generally uh, the, the remnants of the systems that created the records. Um, so it, it's uh, the series titles, files, files or whatever are generally uh, come from the, the, the bureaucracy that was involved in the administration of the White Australia policy. So you'll know that you have to search for other things like the Immigration Restriction Act or certificates of exemption or certificates exempting from the dictation test or just dictation tests. Those sorts of things are likely to bring up relevant records. Um, you'll also know that, that why I do get those hits uh, for White Australia policy when I tick the search notes box is that archivists have gone in and added extra descriptive detail. They've, they've provided more context around series. Uh, and that's what's in the series notes. So where we do pick it up, it's because an archivist has gone in and added a series note where they've put that series in context of the White Australia policy. Um, you might also be thinking, well, look, you know, I'm a real researcher, uh, so I don't, I don't go straight to the, the search box. Um, if I'm at, we're doing research in the National Archives, I'll start with the functions, and I'll see the functions, and then I'll see the agencies which perform particular functions, and then I'll find the series that are uh, created by those particular agencies, because that's the way the series system works. Um, and that's good, but of course the allure of the search box is always very strong. Um, uh, and we can't ignore that. I mean, there was actually a study in Europe where uh, they, they talked to a lot of historians and they asked them what was important in finding resources and they all talked about the importance of provenance and context in, in discovering resources and then when they looked at what they actually did, they all went to Google. Um, so, you know, there's a bit of a disconnect there. And Google has, has really trained us to think that search will just work. You know, we type stuff in, we get it back, it's magic. Um, a nice little exercise to try with students is, um, I don't know if you, if you know how you, you, know, you type a search into to Google and it tells you you have 15 million results, uh, matching results. That's made up, right? They, um, they've actually got no real way of knowing exactly how many matching results they have. So it's sort of an estimate. But what's really cool is if you get a room full of people and you get them to try the same search, they'll often get different numbers of results um, back from Google. So it's a nice reminder that you know, these things we take for granted as, of accuracy and, uh, uh, and truth in terms of search engines are, are to some extent fictional. Um, the other thing that happens 
you know, uh, search interfaces like Record Search and others, they're not very good at telling you what it is that you're actually searching. You know, are you just searching metadata? Are you searching text? What fields are you searching? Are you searching? Um, you know, you often have an advanced search where you can go through and do that sort of stuff, but most people never use advanced searches. Um, so it, it can be really difficult in terms of just understanding the context in which your search is happening, what's going on. And I think it's um, even exacerbated nowadays because we do have a mix of, of, um, of uh, search interfaces and collections where in some cases you will be just searching metadata, you know, titles and authors and things like that, and in other contexts you will actually be searching the full text of resources. And often you're switching between the two. And that produces quite different results. Um, and indeed, uh, in Trove now, I mean Trove obviously the newspapers, you're searching the full text. A lot of the other resources on Trove, you're just searching the metadata. But in some cases now, you'll actually be searching across a mix of both. So you might know that um, uh, uh, the National Library has been digitising a whole lot of uh, new books and journals, for example, things like the Bulletin and the Lone Hand and various other journals have now been digitised and put online. Um, and they are searchable uh, as full text. But the actual entries for those things, the articles, the individual articles, end up in Trove's journal zone, which brings together stuff from all over the place. And so you're actually mixing up metadata and full text searches when you do that. In most cases you won't notice because relevance ranking does its best to try and find the stuff which it thinks is most uh, significant for you. But again, you know, there, there's a sort of black box element here. You don't quite know what's happening. You don't quite know why relevance ranking is returning particular resources. You don't quite know what difference it makes um, if you're indexing the full text of resources as opposed to just the titles of, of articles. <coughs> and um, we may well, I don't know, has anybody tried like searching in the bulletin or one of those new digitized journals that's on Trove? Um, it's not easy. Uh, the, um, as I say, the, 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 it's indexed at article level, so they're there, but it's not straight. It's not a straightforward matter of saying, you know, I want to search within the bulletin for articles relating to this, because the articles are just thrown in there in the journal zone. You actually have to do a little hack yourself, where you go and find the record for the journal. You find the little identifier which starts with nla.obj. You grab that identifier and then you include that in your search. So that means you're searching for articles in the bulletin and then add whatever keywords that you want. But don't worry, you don't have to do that because I made something. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this, I've been including this here as a sort of classic hack, really. Um, so I made a site which um, harvests information from Trove about digitized journals and provides an easy way for you to search through them. So you can, uh, like if you want to search for the bulletin, you filter it there, you say, okay, it's the bulletin, you just select it. Uh, then you go and search for, what do you want to search for in the bulletin? Quick, something, tell me something. Football. Suffrage. Football? Oh. Folklore got in just first. It was football. <laughs> football, was it? Yeah. Oh, sorry, accent, sorry. <laughs> football. Yeah. You're just not much of a footballer, I imagine. <laughs> uh, oh, it might not be because I'm, I should have opened this in a new window, sorry. Um, so. Uh, I'll just do that again. So yes, yeah, so these are all that, and, and I update it sort of every few weeks um, because new material is being added all the time. Um, and and so then it brings back all the articles uh, on the bulletin relating to football. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it's one of the, as, as I say, it's a classic hack. You know, it's it's really annoying that you can't do this within Trove itself. There are reasons for that, and unfortunately, it was one of those battles that I lost while I was working at Trove. Um, but because we can get the data out of Trove, 
I can create a little sort of hack here. It's not like this is going to be a, a, a permanent thing. You know, hopefully that sort of functionality will eventually turn up in Trove and be able to search them easily. But for the moment, it just provides people, it, you know, it solves a particular problem at this moment so that people can go in and, and find that stuff easily uh, and, you know, get a better understanding of what's actually there. <coughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, search engines, you know, offer that illusion of everything, right? You, you, you know, if, if, if you can't find it, it doesn't exist. Uh, they, they, they're really good at... Um, uh, at you know they do lie they do deceive but they do it very confidently uh, in a way that doesn't give you any sort of opportunities for sort of um, finding the sort of chinks in their armor um, and that illusion of everything of course is really um, significant um, as we sort of deal with uh, the, the historical record because we know that it's only a tiny fraction so it's something that we as historians have to really work against. Um, argue against to try and put this into some sort of context. But my question sort of here is, um, you know, what's new? Um, you know, historians are always seeking to understand the gaps and the silences within the historical record. You know, we are trained um, in a sort of critical analysis of, of context, you know, when we look at a, a source. We're always concerned with, with where it came from, um, uh, what it means in its, its particular context. So what I suppose I'm saying is not that this is a new skill for historians, but really that we have to um, extend this form of analysis from just uh, the historical sources themselves to the systems that deliver those sources to our browser. Um, and there are opportunities here. Um, you know, while you know, you can't find what you can't find. There are, because the, these things are online, because we can hack them and tinker with them, we can start to find traces of, of uh, problems, of things that have gone wrong, of, of, of gaps, of, of silences. Um, you may have seen me talk before about my adventures with Hansard. Um, so uh, basically, I, I harvested all of the Hansard from 1901 to 1980 from the Parliament House website. Um, I've created my own version of Hansard, which you can look at. But in the process of harvesting all those, those data files from the Parliament House website, I discovered that I think it was around 90 sitting days were actually missing. Um, and this is, these red blocks here show you the bits that the, the sitting days that are actually missing. Um, and we can sort of zoom in there. So this is the Senate, and it was focused on the Senate. Um, but you can see that um, it was very much around the World War I period, so that if you had been relying on uh, Parlinfo, the Parliament database, to access Hansard, uh, in the, to access Senate debates relating to World War I, you would have been missing a whole lot of stuff. You just wouldn't have known it was, was there, because the files were empty, they weren't showing up in search results. Um, this has all been fixed, by the way. Um, as a result of me pointing this out, Parliament have done a lot of work in the Parliamentary Library, have done a lot of work in identifying problems with that, um, and uh, all the, the, the original problems that I found have been fixed, and they're also doing some other checks as well. Um, I had a similar case with ASIO files at the National Archives, where um, some years ago I'd harvested all that publicly available ASIO files uh, from record search, and when I went to sort of redo that harvest to check some data, I discovered that about 400 of the files that I previously harvested were no longer there. Um, so I asked the archives about what was going on with these files, uh, and it turned out it was uh, a result of their uh, reorganization, shifting into their new building. They'd um, um, actually sent some physical files back to ASIO, um, and had sort of wrongly uh, marked them in record search. So they were still there, they still existed, they weren't destroyed or hidden or anything like that, but the, the, the public entries were hidden from record search because somebody had ticked the wrong box. Um, uh, I'm not, I think most of them are back now, I haven't checked that they're all back. There was some toing and froing with ASIO, I think. Um, now, as somebody who works with, with technology and systems and stuff, you know, these things happen. Um, and I'm not 
sort of trying to um, send any blame any way because you know um, I know that processes and systems just fail. Um, my point is really that we should expect that. Um, we should approach these these tools and these interfaces with the expectation that, that there is a problem. They are lying. Um, you know there are failures, and that just should be part of our critical approach to research. Um, for example, you know we all know uh, that there's a major problems with uh, digitised text co collections is the quality of OCR, optical character recognition, right? You know, that can make a big difference in terms of, of what you can find and what you can use. Um, and, I mean, Trove, obviously, the digitised newspapers. I mean, one great thing about the, I mean, anybody who's used the digitised newspapers will know the variability of the OCR output, right? Um, one good thing about Trove is that it at least exposes that OCR output. You know, some commercial services um, you're, you can search across the full text, but you're never actually shown what it is that you're searching on that, that, that OCR text. And um, uh, you can also, again, do some little experiments here. Um, so this is, this is using a tool that I've created called Query Pick, which enables you to visualize searches in Trove's newspaper um, zone. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about Query Pick this afternoon if somebody would like to, to know more about it and how you use it. Um, but basically, as you can see there, it shows you the number of uh, newspaper articles per year that match your query. In this case, my query is TBE. Anybody know why I would be searching for TBE? Uh, yep. It's a really common OCR error. <laughs> it's the with the, which has been wrongly recognized by OCR as TBE. Um, so what it provides is a little marker of OCR quality, in a way. Um, so by searching for that, we can look across time and see where, uh, you know, the, the, effectively the percentage of articles that, that clearly have significant OCR problems. You know, it's a rough measure, but it's something, you know. We don't have, um, in order to do sort of detailed analysis of those OCR quality, you'd have to download all the text, you'd have to do sort of quite complicated calculations in terms of looking at the language and comparing it to, to dictionaries and things like that. So this provides us just with a rough measure that you can do now. And again, yes, you can do it. Try it yourself. So if you just go to the Trove web interface, you can just type in TBE. Um, and you can use the facets on the side of Trove to get an idea about how common it is across different newspapers. The facets include decades and years, so you can actually get an idea without having to create something in, in query big. You can just get an idea from that in terms of the distribution of, of OCR errors across Trove. So there are simple ways that we can start to interrogate these sorts of systems. Um, for bonus points, now you're probably all thinking, yes, but people correct the OCR output. Uh, and it's all going to be fixed. Right. <laughs> um, another a challenge for you, extra challenge for you. I haven't got to try it yourself, but you can do this intro in the web interface. Search for has colon corrections, um, and you can also search for not, as in capital N O T, has corrections. It will show you the number of articles that have or don't have corrections, and then you can you know divide the the has by the has not. Uh, and come up with a percentage of articles which have corrections. I think last time I checked it was about three or four percent. Um, so there's a long way to go. I mean, the, the crowdsource text corrections has been incredibly popular uh, and successful, but in, just in terms of volume, there's a huge task there. And we'll see different approaches to that in the future, I'm sure. And is it still the case that if you correct off screen, that there's no way you can put that back in as a set of corrections. You no, have, to, have do to, to do it on via their method. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There were some features added a couple of years ago, like the ability to add new lines and things like that, mm -hmm. which um, a lot of users have asked for. Um, but no, not you can't just sort of do it and then paste it in. Mm -hmm. It's because it's done on line by line in yeah. terms of the back end. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so. Yeah, search engines are really good at hiding their flaws. Um, but if we think about the sorts of questions that we ask them, we can start to see some of their limits. <gasps> what? 
<laughs> I know, it's a shock. <laughs> um, look, yeah, look, I got this for you for, um, for those of you who are concerned about what we lose through digitalization. Uh, you can buy a candle with old book smell. Um, <laughs> so as you're, you're sitting there sort of looking at digitized newspapers or whatever, you can light your candle and sort of, you know, <laughs> think that you're really in a library. And, um, I'm actually glad it because you know often we get bogged down in that question of um, what's better, you know, the original physical things or the the digital copies, um, and uh, my point is just that they're different. I mean, it's obvious, really, but we still often have those discussions, and it frustrates me greatly. They're different. You know, we use them in different ways. Um, it's easy to browse through a book, but you can't search. Right? Um, and we also need to recognise that, that many of the people who would never set foot in a, a, a state library, let alone national library or national archives or whatever, are now using their resources online. And for them, digital is the default. Um, and this raises really important um, questions about what they see online. What is the representation of our culture and our history which is presented through online collections? Now, if uh, you've been to one of my talks before, you might have seen this. If you have, don't give away the, the, uh, the answer. Um, this is uh, a chart showing the number of digitized newspaper articles in Trove across the whole lot. Um, we can see oh, a couple of interesting features. First of all, this is what we call the copyright cliff of death. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's post-1954. Um, Again, something which is not terribly obvious if you're just searching from the search interface and um, the, the why that happens. But I want to point to that little peak there. Um, and uh, there's a peak there around 1914, 1915, in number of newspaper articles. Um, why? Did something happen in 1914, 15 that might have meant there were more newspaper articles? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone know the answer? Why is that peak there? Because of a um, concerted effort to digitise that point? Yep, it's, it's money. It's priorities. Um, we're the libraries that get together to decide what's going to be digitised at any particular time in the lead up to the centenary of World War I decided that they should focus on the digitisation of World War I era newspapers. Um, that, that little chart is from a year or so back, um, but again, do it yourself. You can go to, to, to query pick, you can uh, paste in that URL and you can generate uh, a current version of that chart to see whether it's changed. Um, last I tried, it hadn't actually changed very much. So you're still seeing that World War I effect. And what that means, of course, again, is you know, it's not obvious when you just type a, a search into the search box. Um, you will get more results from the World War I period simply because there are more articles from the World War I period. Um, um, but that's not, not revealed by the interface itself. Um, you know, decisions have been made about priorities, and that's natural, it's necessary. I mean, we have to do that, institutions have to do that. Um, but the point is really that we're not good at communicating how those priorities affect our access to resources online. We all know it's, it's, it slivers all the way down. Um, digitization priorities are just the latest filter sitting on top of, uh, you know, decades of, of accidents and policies and selection and politics that create our collections. You know, digitization is just another sliver on top of all those other slivers, um, which are filtering our access to those uh, to those collections. So, um, you know, how? Well, the question is, you know, if digital is the default for many uses, and if we don't have a good understanding of, of how these uh, priorities are sh shape our access, is what sort of picture of the past does or do digitization polic policies create? How does it change what we can see? Um, so to have a look at this, I harvested all of the series level data from the National Archives, so 62,000 odd series. Um, and for each series, I tried to calculate the number of items that had been digitized, the number of items that had been described. Um, and then I aggregated those series by functions. Um, you know, functions like defense, education. 
uh, community services, those sorts of things, which are, I mean, the National Archives creates a thesaurus of government functions, so it was using those sort of top level functions. Now, the data itself is a bit dodgy just because of the way record search works and the way the functions are assigned, but you can start to generate some interesting looking pictures. So, this is um, functions by quantity. So, this is the, the linear meter. You know, the number of records actually sitting on the shelves in the National Archives, um, as I say, sort of uh, grouped by function. So you can see that the biggest one there is community services, um, and uh, we've got sort of quite large immigration holdings, as you would expect. And you can see defence there is quite significant. So keep your eye on defence. Um, so that's the, the the linear meters, the quantity on the shelves. If we switch now to look at um, how they look, how the National Archives looks, if we focus only on the number of items that have been digitised. Um, so we get quite a different picture. Defence obviously is a lot larger and I keep losing community services. Uh, there it is over here. So just... Um, I mean, you know, it's really no surprise that defence and immigration, for example, are highly represented in digitisation because we know that a lot of digitisation has been around things like family history, for example. Um, but the defence, so it's interesting that it's still there. I mean, there is one particular act which has uh, uh, shaped that, that picture of defence in particular, and that was the Howard government's uh, decision to fund the digitization of all the World War I service records, the 375,000 World War I service records, which was called a gift to the nation. Um, and you can still see that effect through looking at the sort of digitization patterns in the National Archives, that, that there was such a large intervention that it really has shaped that picture significantly. So, I mean, I think there's an obvious argument here that we need to actually be uh, engaged with these priorities. Um, uh, you know, to ask questions about what gets dig digitised and why. Uh, Trove's di uh, newspaper program, Digitised newspaper paper program, you can, um, there are options to, you know, suggest newspapers to be digitised, um, and that sort of goes into the priority setting, so there is a possibility there. And it can, of course, you can you know, raise money and get your own newspaper digitised. Um, but you know, there are obviously lots of questions here about, for example, the roles of commercial arrangements with, with uh, things like Ancestry. Um, you know, if, uh, you know um, that means, you know, are the things which are most likely to be digitised then the things which are going to have value to a service like Ancestry? You know, their capacity to on-sell that effectively to their users. Um, also interested, um, Carol and I were talking this before about the, the uh, digitization costs uh, with the National Archives, and, you know, and probably most of you will know that they went up dramatically um, a year or so ago. Uh, and the National Archives has always, you know, rightly um, talked about the success of their digitization of demand program, and that was effectively that anybody could ask for a file to be digitized or ask for access to a file, and if they did ask for a, a copy of the file that was digitised and made publicly available. So that basically people were, were funding the digitisation of the collection according to their own interests and priorities. Um, and so that you know, gave an opportunity for people to shape the direction of, 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 of digitisation. So the question is now, I'm assuming that the prices now are going to mean that a lot, a lot fewer people are going to be putting in requests for digitisation. Um, so that digitisation on demand program is going to be radically changed uh, in terms of what its outcomes are. Tim, I was looking for the receipt from the National Archives <laughs> to find out um, how much that cost, but I can't find it because the search engine on my Outlook Express is so bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but while you were talking, the email came through from the National Archives <laughs> with, <laughs> with the copy of them. <laughs> so I was just saying it's been ages and I haven't seen it, it just came through now. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, these sorts of things will change the the what's online. You know, the decisions about those sorts of costs. And what's going to happen, of course, is probably you know probably what you will do now is um, people will increasingly use their own cameras to take pictures of of files, and they'll establish private collections, 
you know, we have to think about, and I know there are some movements in that regard in terms of creating some sort of commons where people can contribute their own photographs as a way of sort of supplementing the sort of official digitization programs. So, you know, there are lots of important, interesting questions around that and how we shape that process. Um, and the, the sort of flip, the outside of digitization of the National Archives is the, what they call the proactive digitization, um, where, you know, they make decisions about what they're going to digitize. But as far as I can tell, and I have asked about this, there's no public policy around how priorities are set for proactive digitization. So we don't really know um, how things get flagged. So, you know, really in a sense, the, the whole, well, it's, you know, it's, it's unknowable, right? We can't know all of what might have been collected, all of what might have been digitized. Um, it's slivers upon slivers. Um, but we can, I think, using the sort of digital resources we have available, start to sort of zoom out a bit to create these sorts of um, pictures, which enable us to at least identify some of the distortions that have taken place within these processes. Um, you may have seen my, my, so what I did on New Year's Day this year <laughs> um, was, and what I've been doing around New Year's for the last three years is harvesting from record search uh, details of all the files that have the access status have closed. Um, and I did a little sort of running commentary on Twitter this year on, on New Year's Day, sort of starting to analyse those, those results. And it seems only fair to me that on, the, on New Year's Day, which is of course the day when, when we have that sort of celebration of the, the latest cabinet records being opened up and released, that we should also spend a little time to remember those files that didn't make it. Uh, <laughs> Um, those files that went through the access, access examination process in that previous year and, and ended up being closed. Um, and again, uh, you can do this yourself. So, you know, I'm taking advantage again of what's there in record search that you can search for closed files. I mean, you can't access them, you can't see them, but you can actually get the metadata for those closed files. Um, and what my purpose in this is really to start to build up a historical um, picture of the access examination process. You know, it's set down in legislation, but how does it actually operate in practice? Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a human process, it's a historical process. Um, it's not a mechanical thing, it's not technology. So, um, you know, there are changes over time in the way that it's interpreted. Um, but it's difficult to see those. So, um, so I'm starting to, to bring together this data and I've got now three years worth of harvests. Um, and the significant features you can see on that chart. First of all, I mean the most commonly cited reason for closing a file. So I should say that the reasons and the date decisions were made are on record search. So I can grab that data, but you can't actually search for that data, the reasons and the dates on record search itself. So by pulling it out of record search, we can start to look at it in different sorts of ways and take different slices. So these are a breakdown by reasons uh, cited for, for files being closed, and the most commonly cited reason is, is privacy, um, 331G under the Archives Act. Um, also fairly common is the sort of national security one, which is 331A over here. You can also note that most of them are never used. Most of the sort of uh, reasons for exemption cited under the Archives Act are just not used, and you know you could uh, clearly make an argument if you want to clean up the Act that you could reduce the number of exemptions down to you know, two, <laughs> eighty-three, um, based on that. Um, simplify the process. Um, uh, we're all about impact these days, right? And uh, this is this is my claim to, to impact here is that this column here, this pre-access recorder column which was 2,812 in my first harvest, is now two. Um, um, that's because I uh, asked the archives, what is pre-access recorder? Why are there all these files there with this on them? Uh, and it turned out that the reason was there were files which were closed before the introduction of the Archives Act. So they didn't quite, the categories that were closed under didn't quite fit into the categories that were introduced by the Archives Act. So when I asked about it, um, the archives uh, got back to me and said that they decided to sort of clean things up a bit uh, and reduce confusion, so they actually uh, changed the status of those um, pre-access recorder files to not yet examined. 
Uh, <laughs> so they're not actually any more open, um, but, but they're not actually closed anymore. So look, I've, I've, I've unclosed these files. Um, What's the deal with those? Because well, I've asked them for an explanation. I didn't understand the explanation. Of what? Not yet examined. How do you get to look at them? And you just put in an access examination request. Is the little button that you press in record search? Yeah. It just means that nobody's asked for them before. And does that take a long time? It can. can. <laughs> As we'll see <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, in theory, when the sort of you know archives legislation was put through, the idea was that you know basically a lot of files would be um, examined before they came up to the the open period. That they would basically be available once they got to the well, what it was, 30 years now, 20 years. But of course, the reality has been that basically most files are not examined until somebody asks for them to be um, examined. Um, so the thing which, of course, uh, troubles historians most is this column here, uh, which is the withheld pending advice. So these are the files which have actually gone off to agencies uh, before, uh, as part of the access examination process. And you can see here that it's going up, it's been going up by about 400 every year. I mean, it's effectively a backlog of files which are waiting for agencies to give uh, their opinion on whether the files can be released. It's not good when a backlog is going up by 400 a year. Um, I mean, the uh, archives has tried various things over the years, but as you can see there, it's still, it's still um, piling up. And um, I was able this year, based on this data, to start to look at files which had been withheld pending advice, but which had been opened in uh, or open with exceptions in 2017. And uh, the average time that they had been waiting for their decision was, I think it was three years and 30 days. Um, so if a file, now most, a lot of files can just be cleared by the archives without them having to go after agencies. But particular series, um, as David and others know, um, A1838, uh, uh, foreign policy files, often do go back to the agency and they've got a long queue of them and they can take many years. So similarly, defence and ASIO files can also take um, quite a long time. A lot of stuff will just routinely go through and it's not an issue, but some things will be held up. And as you can see, we're now up to 4,213 files which are waiting in that queue. Again, this is not data which you can easily get out of record search. If you're uh, an eager young PhD student wanting to do a topic on Australia's foreign policy, and you think, oh great, I'll, I'll, I'll get some files that nobody's ever looked at before uh, to work on, you're not in a lot of luck, probably. You know? You'll probably have to finish your thesis before the files actually become available. Um, so we need to be aware of that. And, you know, institutions need to get better at communicating this sort of stuff, but we also need to, to take responsibility ourselves in, in, in seeking to understand that and can communicate the limits. Um, and there are, um, you know, access exists within this sort of legislative bureaucratic uh, systems, and we have to be aware of those as well. Um, and there are changes going through the archives for the Archives Act at the moment, uh, they're before Parliament. I haven't even gone through, I'm not actually sure, I haven't checked. Uh, which effectively, well, they're aimed at stopping people making large numbers of requests, effectively. Um, and, um, and they effectively put penalties on people who make large numbers of requests by saying that your, your files are going to take longer. But they also give the archives the ability to extend the statutory 90 day period for when decisions have to be made. Um, which, one of the outcomes I suspect, I don't know this for certain, uh, but I suspect maybe that they no longer use that withheld pending advice flag in record search because they can, um, they, they don't have to justify the fact that it hasn't been done within that 90 days. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering whether basically uh, the numbers are going to be dropping from now on just because that flag is not going to be used. Um, so I'm not going to be able to keep doing those sorts of comparisons. But I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. Um, so, you know, this is just a reminder that we can't take open for granted, right? Um, particularly at this sort of time where, you know, we're getting on the one hand all this excitement about open government data and innovation and what this can do, but at the same time we're seeing a lot of restrictions on the name of security in terms of what access we can information, how we can even share it. 
Um, but again, by hacking around the edges, by turning these systems against themselves. So you know, I've, this is data which is in record search. Um, I've just sort of turned it inside out so that we can see it differently. And there are opportunities for do that with our, with our interfaces. So the question really is, comes down to, well, we might be thinking, OK, uh, surely these problems will all be fixed in time, right? Everything will be OK. Uh, uh, you know, search engines will become more accurate and more accurate, and uh, OCR will be perfected, and systems will be better at communicating their own limits. Well, I don't think so. Um, you know, we're working with complex systems involving people and institutions and collections and, um, and technologies and much more. Um, and I think it's safe to assume that access to our cultural heritage collections will always, in some sense, be broken. Not broken in the sense of being unusual, <coughs> but broken in the sense of needing careful attention and repair. There will always be work to do. And I think that as historians, we have a responsibility to get involved in that work. Um, we need to, in, in Mark Olson's words, get our hands dirty. Um, we need to get better at reading interfaces and not just take them for granted. Um, understanding what they do and what they don't do and why. And I think we also need to create our own interfaces, our own ways into those collections. Um, and that's you know, something that I've, I've been working on for, for many years. Um, you know, how do we get beyond, you know, at best, of, you know, online publication being a PDF? I mean, seriously? Um, you know, there are other options in the ways we can, we can make our work available, ways which actually mean that our publications, our books, our articles actually become gateways to collections, which embed our knowledge and expertise, as well as providing access. Um, we don't have to all become coders, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know. <laughs> um, but we do have to take code seriously as one of the things which does construct the nature of access. Um, and those of us who can code, um, you know, have to provide examples and tools and resources which um, at least provide some glimpses behind the curtain. Um, and, you know, I do things, I just sort of end with a couple of fun examples, really. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be all serious, and anybody who follows my work knows that there's a sort of large, playful element uh, to what I do. Um, but over Christmas, um, I created, using a site called Glitch, which is aimed at sort of you can create little um, applications there and share them and people can remix them and play with them. So it's a really good site for education, for people learning about how these things work. So I created a whole lot of starter kits for making Twitter bots from Trove. So taking particular resources from Trove, whether it's a collection of a particular institution or a particular newspaper or a, a Trove list that you might have created or a set of Trove tags. You can take any of those and use it as the foundation for a Twitter bot, which is tweeting out random stuff from that particular collection. Um, and so I put these out there as a sort of, um, you know, a bit of a gateway drug, getting people interested in sort of making stuff with Trove, um, not just sort of using, consuming the web interface. And I think over 20 bots have been made in the last month or two, the last couple of months, people just jumping in and doing this. Uh, some from you know, particular libraries, some uh, focusing on particular collections, some sort of mashing up newspaper titles. Um, and I've made it in such a way that you, know, you can actually create your bot really simply with just sort of a couple of edits in these files. But from there, you can do quite sort of a lot of customization. So provide people with both being able to get some quick, easy, uh, uh, pleasure from creating something, but also getting them thinking about, well, how could I make this better? How could I improve this? And, on the, and along the way, you actually learn a bit of code. You'll learn a bit of what it means to have access to digital resources online, digital collections like Trove. Um, and of course, access is not just about websites. Um, you know, access is also about things like social media uh, and how we construct and share through those sorts of values. Um, just another little example, if somebody wants to have a, a look through this this afternoon, I would welcome it. So I've started creating a whole lot of new, effectively, tutorials and resources <coughs> using a thing called Jupyter Notebooks, which actually allow you and let you embed live code. Um, so this is a see-through version of QueryPick. So I showed you the, uh, an example of a QueryPick for a graph that you can create online using a web interface that I created. 
Um, but here is effectively the same sort of code, which is sort of all exposed, and you can, oh, I've got a live version here somewhere. Um, you can actually look through it, you can edit some of these, uh, these options, and you can just generate it live on the spot, and you can actually see what's happening. So it gives you that sort of see-through view of the resources. Um, and um, so I'm creating a whole series of these little recipes which allow you to do stuff with, with well, first of all, Trove. Uh, um, so you could explore the different facets in the different zones in Trove. Um, but creating them for other resources ultimately as well, other GLAM collections. So record search, but then other sources of data. To give you examples of what you can do and how you can sort of peek behind the curtain in terms of some of these resources. Um, because, you know, ultimately, um, you know, all of this is really about developing those skills that enable us to read access critically. Um, and I just think, um, you know, this is something which is critical now in the, in the training of historians. But, you know, I'd be interested to hear your own thoughts. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tim, for a terrific talk, full of um, challenges, opportunities, and, and making us think in all sorts of ways. We've just got a few minutes um, available for questions, and I'll do the traditional thing and invite um, Burwood to perhaps um, ask a question or two or a comment or two. Well, I'll ask a question on, on behalf of Chris Waters, who couldn't be here today. Um, thanks, thanks very much, Tim. Um, uh, speaking, of, I mean, really, the access question in many ways goes to um, resourcing and funding, and um, uh, so those who are seeking access to, say, foreign policy documents and those kinds of things, that there's clearly a funding issue and resourcing issue, which may be a deliberate thing. I'm not sure, uh, but also, according to Chris, he said that um, there was evidence that those who were making the decisions about the releasing of um, documents had increasingly fallen to old depots who um, didn't ever want to let anything out much, or old diplomats who, who were concerned. And, and that, that's an interesting thing too, who behind the scenes is making the decisions about access? Yep, absolutely. Um, and again, that goes back to the, the, the fact that this is a human process. I mean, this is not you know, something which is a matter of ticking boxes. There are people particular people who have particular histories themselves who are making decisions about this sort of thing. Um, and you're right, it's not, again, it's not something which we can, which is exposed. Um, and, uh, and the whole thing about that, that sort of process of putting stuff off to the agencies um, is, of course, the agencies have no obligations under the Archives Act. Um, so, I mean, the Archives has set obligations, but in terms of the, the agencies, they, you know, it, it, it's purely sort of goodwill, I suppose, in some way, on, on their part. Um, so, you know, I think there's certainly a discussion which we, as sort of historical community, could be having about how um, we, we try and, and, and um, uh, you know, set down those areas of responsibility and, and, and get agencies to recognise that it is part of their responsibility um, to make sure that material is, is dealt with in a prompt way. And, I mean, it's interesting if you compare, for example, the, the UK situation um, where the, the sort of um, uh, parallel organisation to the Advisory Council of the National Archives, their sort of um, council, actually has a much more active role. Um, it actually, so if, if, organize, if agencies want to close files, um, the, uh, the, the, the council can, and does apparently, argue back, um, you know, make, make sure they can justify why they want to close those files. And so they're, and, and of course they're independent of the archives. I mean, archive staff are always in a difficult position because they have to have good working relationships with the agencies or nothing gets done. You know, they, get, they don't get the files coming into the archives. You know, there, there's got to be those good relationships. So it's, it's interesting in the UK uh, example where they've separated out that sort of, um, the, the sort of good cop, bad cop, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> they've separated out that, that role so that somebody does have that um, role of actually, um, you know, challenging decisions about, about access. Uh, I might have something interesting to say on that last point. Uh, I spent a lot of my time in archives uh, that haven't changed much in 40, 50 years. Uh, they're analogue and there are sort of very detailed um, uh, finding aids and systems that you learn over years. 
uh, in consultation with our clients to get a sense of where things are. And then you probably don't know where everything is because it's so chaotic. Uh, but on the question of how things get released and how things get declassified, it's a fascinating situation across the former Soviet Union where archivists really are the only people um, who, who take these decisions. Uh, they have general guidelines from agencies, but uh, archivists who are small in number, very poorly paid, and dealing with millions and millions and millions of documents, uh, are in the position of having to delineate about what is potentially dangerous, what's okay for consumption, and what isn't. And many of them will tell you they pull their hair out because mistakes on their end can lead to, to quite disastrous consequences for them. The, the example that might interest you is that uh, I, I worked in an archive for months, six, seven months, on uh, a certain set of documents that had just been released. It was very class, it was very sensitive. But of course, when uh, a donor came in with millions of dollars and offered it to the archives to digitise this, of course they jumped at the opportunity. So it was interesting to see what they digitised about five or six years later and what I had in my own personal repository to see what sort of the measures they'd taken to consider what was secret and what was not. And uh, interestingly, it was so haphazard. There was, there, there was, it was very difficult to delineate some sort of method as to what, what would be considered secret, you know. I'm not talking about files, considerable files about mass murder execution, things like that. And when I went back to the archives and I sat down with the head archivist and I asked her, I said, what's going on? And she laughed and she said, we had three months to release, I think, 450,000 documents. Yeah, we stayed up all night trying to, and she said, by the end of it, we, had, we just just let it go. And she said, well, the problem with that, of course, is that when uh, people started using these documents and you know, representative agencies that were implicated in this started to come up in arms and w went to the archives and sort of wanted blood, the archivist said, of course, you know, you only, you only pay us $5,000 a year and you expect us to work seven days a week. And so that was an opportunity for a renegotiation of pay. But... The, the, the point I'm making is that when you're, when you're dealing with millions and millions of, or perhaps hundreds and thousands of sources and you have limited staff and resources, what possible sort of constellation of, of, of relationships between agencies that are possible to enable sort of a, a quick and somehow you know, transparent release of documents? It's so difficult. Thanks, Phil. Um, if you have to go, Boo, then we, we understand. Yes, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll have to go. There's people waiting for the room. So th well, thanks very much, Jim. That's may, fascinating. may see some of you again after one. If you're available, then, then great. Yep. But um, otherwise, we'll, we'll do. I'll, I'll just, um, after you've left, I'll, I'll just let Tim okay. respond briefly. All right. But thanks very much. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I know. I mean, and that really just goes to the fact that. Um, the way that these sorts of decisions are made or not made, you know, can be, involve all sorts of historical circumstances. Um, but um, the, um, I, I mean, part of the problem, get, I mean, in the Australian context, is that we don't know, for example, we don't know what, why, on what grounds some files are central agencies for um, advice, and on what grounds they, you know, the archives themselves just do it. Um, so while we have, you know, under the Archives Act, we have like, you know, a sentence or two in terms of the exemption. Um, we don't really know how that's interpreted within those particular contexts. Um, is it, um, you know, there, there's, to what extent is it about sort of real national security and how much is it about sort of, you know, potential embarrassment, for example? You know, and I think most of us would say, okay, yes, we understand there are real reasons why uh, in particular, some particular national security areas, why stuff needs to be withheld, but we question if it's just a matter of embarrassing particular departments or ministers, whether that's uh, justifiable grounds. Um, but we don't know, because <laughs> we don't know how, how those sort of things break down. So um, I think, you know, and a lot of these things just, um, you know, people are willing to accept problems if institutions are trying to be transparent about what the problems are. Um, and um, I, I think it would be a much more productive place if, um, I mean, the archives has actually has released some information in the past. It's, it's sort of taken some of their measures for access examination out of their last annual report, so we actually got less information at the moment. Um, 
if there was just much more openness around these problems, and if they had a review done of their access procedures uh, last year or the year before, um, we don't know what that review said, it hasn't been released. The review was conducted by a former Deputy Secretary of DFAT and a former head, who was also a former head of ASIO. Um, um, so it's, it's, yeah, I think, I think the frustration of researchers is, is, is there's so many unknowns around this process. Um, oh. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I suppose that's part of what I'm trying to do in sort of bringing these data together is at least seeing what we can at least know um, as a way of then starting to think about well, how can we improve. Interesting. We, we probably should draw a conclusion here as well on that note. Um, so I'm going to go on to, to thank you again for your um, and, and also reminding people that we'll be back here um, at one o'clock um, to have